Princess and other liberating fairy tales. This is the front cover. And it's written by Jay Williams and illustrated by Rick Schreiter. This was uh, a gift when I was about eight or nine years old from my parents, and um, I hope you enjoy it. It has actually one, two, three, four, five, six six different stories so this isn't chapter one this is the first story called uh, the practical princess the practical princess princess bedelia was as lovely as the moon shining upon a lake full of water lilies she was as graceful as a cat leaping and she was also extremely practical. When she was born, three fairies had come to her cradle to give her gifts, as was usual in that country. The first fairy had given her beauty. The second had given her grace. But the third, who was a wise old creature, had said, I give her common sense. Common sense? I don't think much of that gift said King Ludwig, raising his eyebrows. <laughs> what good is common sense to a princess? All she needs is charm. Nevertheless, when Bedelia was 18 years old, something happened which made the king change his mind. A dragon moved into the neighborhood. He settled in a dark cave on top of a mountain and the first thing he did was to send a message to the king. I must have a princess to devour, the message said, or I shall breathe out my fiery breath and destroy the kingdom. Sadly, King Ludwig called together his counselors and read them the message. Perhaps, said the prime minister, we had better advertise for a knight to slay the dragon. That is what generally happens in these cases, isn't it? I'm afraid we haven't time, answered the king. The dragon has only given us until tomorrow morning. There is no help for it. We shall have to send him the princess. Princess Bedelia had come to the meeting because as she said, she liked to mind her own business. And this was certainly her own business. Rubbish, she said. Dragons can't tell the difference between princesses and anyone else. Use your common sense. He's just asking for me because he's a snob. That may be so, said her father, but if we don't send you along, he will destroy the kingdom. Right, said Bedelia, I see, I have to deal with this myself. She left the council chamber. She got the largest and most beautiful of her state robes and stuffed it with straw and tied it together with string. Into the centre of the bundle, she packed about a hundred pounds of gunpowder. She got two strong young men to carry it up the mountain for her. She stood in front of the dragon's cave and called, Come out! Here's the princess! The dragon came blinking and peering out of the darkness. Seeing the bright robe covered with gold and silver, silver embroidery and heard Bedelia's voice, he opened his mouth wide. At Bedelia's signal, the two young men swung the robe and gave it a good heave right down the dragon's throat. Bedelia threw herself flat on the ground and the two young men ran. As the gunpowder met the flames inside the dragon, can you guess what happened? That's right. There was a tremendous explosion. Got up, dusting herself off. 
dragons, she said. They're not very bright. She left the two young men sweeping up the pieces and she went back to the castle to have her geography lesson. The lesson that morning was local geography. Our kingdom, Arapathia, is bounded on the north by Iceland, said the teacher. Lord Garp, the ruler of Iceland, is old, crafty, rich and greedy. At that very moment, Lord Garp of Iceland was arriving at the castle. Word of Bedelia's destruction of the dragon had reached him. That girl, he said, is just the wife for me. And he had come with a hundred finely dressed courtiers and many presents to ask King Ludwig for her hand. The king sent for Bedelia. My dear, <coughs> he said, clearing his throat nervously, <coughs> just, just see who is here. I see. It's Lord Garp, said Bedelia. She turned to go. He wants to marry you, said the king. Bedelia looked at Lord Garp. His face was like an old napkin, crumpled and wrinkled. It was covered in warts as if someone had left crumbs on the napkin. He had only two teeth. Six long hairs grew from his chin and none on his head. She felt like screaming. However, she said, I'm very flattered. Thank you, Lord Garb. Just let me talk to my father in private for a minute, please. When they had retired to a small room behind the throne, Bedelia said to the king, what will Lord Garb do if I refuse to marry him? Oh, he is rich and greedy and crafty, said the king unhappily. He is also used to having his own way in everything. He will be insulted. He will probably declare war on us and then there will be trouble. Very well, said Bedelia. We must be practical. She returned to the throne room, smiling sweetly at Lord Garp and said, My Lord, as you know, it is customary for a princess to set tasks for anyone who wishes to marry her. Surely you wouldn't like me to break that custom. And you are bold and powerful enough, I know, to perform any task. Hmm, that is true said Lord Garp smugly, stroking the six hairs on his chin. Name your task. Bring me, said Bedelia, a branch from the jewel tree of Paxis. Lord Garp bowed. And off he went. I think, said Bedelia to her father, that we have seen the last of him. For Paxis is a thousand miles away and the jewel tree is guarded by lions, serpents and wolves. But in two weeks, Lord Garp was back. With him, he bore a chest and from the chest, he took a wonderful twig. Its bark was of rough gold. The leaves that grew of it were of fine silver. The twig was covered with blossoms and each blossom had petals of mother of pearl and centers of sapphires, the color of the evening sky. Adelia's heart sank. She took the twig, but then she said to herself, use your common sense, my girl. Lord Garp never traveled 2,000 miles in two weeks. Nor is he the man to fight his way through lions and serpents and wolves. She looked more carefully at the branch. And she said, My lord, you know that the jewel tree of Paxis is a living tree or 
although it is made of jewels. <laughs> Why, of course, said Lord Garp. Everyone knows that. Well then, said Bedelia, then why is it that these blossoms have no scent? Lord Garp turned red. I think, Bedelia went on, that this branch was made by the jewellers of Icefen, who are the best in the world. Not very nice of you, my lord. Some people might even call it cheating. <laughs> lord Garp shrugged. He was too old and rich to feel ashamed. But like many men used to having their own way, the more Bedelia refused him, the more he was determined to have her. Never mind all that, he said. Set me another task. This time I swear I will perform it. Bedelia sighed. Very well. Then bring me a cloak made of the skins from the salamanders who live in the volcano of Scoria. Lord Garp bowed, and off he went. The volcano of Scoria, said the dealer to her father, is covered with red hot lava. It burns steadily with great flames and pours out poisonous smoke so that no one can come within a mile of it. Oh, you have certainly profited by your geography lessons said the king with admiration. Nevertheless, in a week, Lord Garp was back. This time, he carried a cloak that shone and rippled like all the colours of the fire. It was made of scaly skins stitched together with golden wire as fine as a single hair. Bedelia took this splendid cloak and she said to yourself, use your head, miss. Lord Garp never climbed the red hot slopes of the volcano of Scoria. A fire was burning in the fireplace of the throne room. Bedelia hurled the cloak into it. <laughs> the skins blazed up in a flash, <laughs> blackened and fell to ashes. Lord Garp's mouth fell open. Before he could speak, Bedelia said, that cloak was a fake. My Lord, the skins of the salamanders who can live in the volcano of Scoria wouldn't burn. Lord Garp turned pale with anger. He hopped up and down, unable at first to do anything but splatter. Bam, 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 he cried. Then controlling himself, he said, so be it. If I can't have you, then no one shall. He pointed a long skinny finger at her. On the finger was a magic ring. At once, a great wind arose. It blew through the throne room. It sent King Ludwig flying one way and his guards the other. It picked up Bedelia and whisked her off through the air. When she could catch her breath and look about her, she found herself in a room at the top of a tower. Bedelia peered out of the window. About the tower stretched an empty barren plain. As she watched, a speck appeared in the distance. A plume of dust rose behind it. It drew nearer and became Lord Garth on horseback. He rode to the tower and looked up at Bedelia. Ah ha! He croaked. So you are safe and snug, are you? And will you marry me now? Never, said Bedelia firmly. Then stay there until never comes, snarled Lord Garp. And away he rode. For the next two days, Bedelia felt very sorry for herself. She sat wistfully by the window, looking out at the empty plain. When she was hungry, food appeared on the table. When she was tired, she lay down on the narrow cot and slept. Each day, Lord Garp rode by and asked if she had changed her mind. And each day, 
she refused him. Her only hope was that, as so often happens in old tales, a prince might come riding by who would rescue her. But on the third day, she gave herself a shake. Now then, pull yourself together, she said sternly. If you sit waiting for a prince to rescue you, you may sit here forever. Be practical. If there's any rescuing to be done, you're going to have to do it by yourself. She jumped up. There was something she had not yet done, and now she did it. She tried the door. It opened. Outside were three other doors, but there was no sign of a stair or any other way down from the top of the tower. She opened two of the doors and found they led into cells just like hers, but empty. Behind the fourth door, however, lay what appeared to be a haystack. From beneath it came the sound of snores. And between snores, a voice said, 16 million and 12. 16 million and 13. 16 million and 14. Cautiously, she went closer. Then she saw that what she had taken for a haystack was in fact an immense pile of blonde hair. Parting it, she found a young man sound asleep. As she stared, he opened his eyes. He blinked at her. Who? He said. Then he said, 16 million and 15. And closed his eyes and fell asleep again. Bedelia took him by the shoulder and shook him hard. He awoke yawning. <gasps> Tried to sit up. But the mass of hair made this difficult. What on earth is the matter with you? Bedelia asked. Who are you? I am Prince Perilum, he replied. The rightful ruler of... Oh dear, here I go again. 60 million. His eyes began to close. Bedelia shook him again. He made a violent effort and managed to wake up enough to continue. A vicemen, but Lord Garp has put me under a spell. I have to count sheep jumping over a fence and this puts me to sleep. He began to snore lightly. Dear me, said Bedelia, I must do something. She thought hard. Then she pinched Perian's ear and this woke him with a sleep. <coughs> Listen, she said. It's quite simple. It's all in your mind, you see. You are imagining the sheep jumping over the fence. No! Don't go to sleep again! This is what you must do. Imagine them jumping backwards. And as you do, count backwards. And then, when you get to one, you'll be awake. The prince's eyes snapped over. Marvellous! He said, will it work? It's bound to, said Bedelia, for if the sheep going one way will put you to sleep, then, then going back the other way will wake you up. Hastily, the prince began to count. Six million and fourteen, six million and thirteen, six million and twelve. Oh my goodness, said Bedelia, count by hundreds or you'll never get there. He began to gabble as fast as he could, and with each moment that passed, his eyes sparkled more brightly. His face grew livelier, and he seemed a little stronger, until at last he shouted, Five, four, three, two, one, and awoke completely. He struggled to his feet with a little help from Adelia. Heavens, he said, look how my hair and beard have grown. I've been here for years. Thank you, my dear. Who are you and what are you doing here? Bedelia quickly explained. Perrin shook his head. 
One more crime of Lord Carp's, he said. We must, we must escape and see that he is punished. Easier said than done, said Bedelia. There's no stair in this tower as far as I can tell, and the outside wall is much too smooth to climb. <laughs> Perion frowned. This will take some thought, he said. What we need is a long rope. Use your common sense, said Bedelia. We haven't any rope. Then her face brightened and she clapped her hands. But we have your beard, <laughs> she laughed. Perrion understood at once and chuckled. <laughs> I'm sure it will reach almost to the ground, he said, but we haven't any scissors to cut it off with. That is so, said Bedelia. Hang it out of the window and let me climb down. I'll search the tower and perhaps I can find a ladder or a hidden stair. If all else fails, I can go for help. She and the prince gathered up great, great armfuls of the beard and staggered into Bedelia's room, which had the largest window. The prince's long hair trailed behind and nearly tripped him. He threw the beard out of the window and sure enough, the end of it came to with a, within a few feet of the ground. Perry embraced himself, holding the beard with both hands to ease the pull on his chin. Bedelia climbed out of the window and slid down the beard. She dropped to the ground and sat for a moment breathless. And she sat there, out of the wilderness, came the drumming of hoofs, a cloud of dust, and then the up the swift horse. With one glance, he saw what was happening. He shook his fist up at Prince Perion. Meddlesome fool, he shouted. I'll teach you to interfere. He leaped from the horse and grabbed the beard. He gave it a tremendous yank. Head first came Perrion out of the window. Down he fell and with a thump, he landed right on top of Lord Gar. This saved Perrion, who was not hurt at all, but it was the end of Lord Gar. Perrion and Bedelia rode back to Icefen on Lord Garp's horse. <laughs> In the great city, the prince was greeted with cheers of joy. Once everyone had recognised him after so many years and under so much hair. And of course, since Bedelia had rescued him from captivity, she married him. First, however, she made him get a haircut and a shave so that she could see what he really looked like. For she was always practical. So if you enjoyed that and you would like me to read you the second story in the book, let me know in the comments below and uh, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Have a lovely evening wherever you are, whatever is happening, stay safe and love to you all. <laughs>